Our final reading uh, this afternoon is taken from 2 Kings chapter 9, uh, 2 Kings chapter 9, and we're going to uh, begin there with verse 1, and we'll continue reading through to verse 13, uh, 2 Kings chapter 9, uh, beginning with verse 1 and continuing to verse 13. Then Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Tie up your garments and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when you arrive, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, and go in and have him rise from among his fellows and lead him to an inner chamber. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and do not linger. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead, and when he came, behold, the commanders of the army were in council, and he said, I have a word for you, O commander. And Jehu said, To which of us all? And he said, To you, O commander. So he arose and went into the house, and the young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel, and you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male Bond are free in Israel, and I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. And when Jehu came out to the servants of his master, they said to him, Is all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you? And he said to them, You know the fellow and his talk. And they said, That is not true. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and so he spoke to me, saying, Thus says the Lord. I anoint you king over Israel. Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. Well, we want to come to God once more in prayer. Let's pray. Great God, gracious, loving, merciful, heavenly Father, draw near to us just now, speaking to us through your word, those words which we need to hear. May your word dwell in us richly in all knowledge and spiritual understanding. May we indeed know the mind and will of the Lord as your word is opened to us this afternoon. May your spirit be our teacher and may he lead us into all truth. This is our prayer. For our Savior's sake. Amen. Amen. 
Well, do keep your Bibles uh, open in front of you, returning in the first instance to 2 Kings chapter 4, and then we'll look again in a moment at 2 Kings chapter 6, and we'll conclude in the not too distant future in 2 Kings chapter 9. What do these three passages of Scripture have to do with one another? What do they have in common? They all speak to us about the relationship of Elisha to a group of men called the sons of the prophets. And in each of the three passages we've read, we discover a different aspect of his ministry to them and his care for them. Also, we see in these passages a foreshadowing of the relationship of our Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples and particularly that group of disciples that he would afterward call to be apostles. And there is much that we can see uh, in the form of type and symbol in Elisha, which points to a greater fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. But in the kind providence of God, there are also some things that we can learn and discern together uh, this evening as it relates to the support of those who serve the Lord. Some principles that I trust we will be able to put into practice as we seek to pray for Reuben and Kathy in the months to come and also to aid them practically in the work which God has given them to do. Interesting thing about historic narrative is Uh, The principles are stated in prose. So the principles are not stated explicitly, but they are implicit in the understanding of the scriptures themselves. Now, because they're not stated explicitly, we have to be very careful that the principles that we do derive from them are in keeping with the whole counsel of of God, and in no way uh, erode our confidence in the full sufficiency of Scripture as it is. Now, sadly, what often happens in passages such as these is people begin to allegorize, and they begin to say, well, you know, this symbolizes that, and this represents the other. And truth of the matter is... There are symbols in Scripture, and representative uh, language is used in the Word of God. But we dare not be so bold as to try to connect dots that ought not to be connected, and to try to make symbols uh, of things that were not intended to be symbols, or certainly to draw uh, actual Uh, truths based on an allegorical interpretation. So with that necessary preamble and that necessary disclaimer, I I do want to speak to you about Elisha and the sons of the prophets. I don't have 53 minutes worth for you uh, this afternoon. Some of you were were thinking, that sounds pretty good compared to what we normally get, but... uh, Don't have 53 minutes for you this afternoon, but I do want to highlight a couple of principles about Elisha's relationship to the sons of the prophets. First of all, could I speak to you about his protection of them? His protection of them. Could I ask you to uh, look with me again? Uh, there to 2 Kings chapter 4. And rather than you just taking my word for it, uh, let me show you exactly what the Word of God says. 
Elisha came again to Gilgal, I'm in verse 38, uh, when there was a famine in the land and as the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, uh, he said to his servant, uh, set on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. And one of them went out into the field to gather herbs and he found a wild vine and he gathered from it his lap full of wild gourds. He came and cut them up into the pot of stew, not knowing what they were. And they poured uh, out some for the men to eat. But while they were eating of the stew, they cried out, O man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat it. And he said, then bring flour. And he threw it, that is the flour, into the pot. And he says, then pour out some for the men that they may eat and then pay particular attention to just the next few words. And there was no harm in the pot. I think we can safely say that in terms of his protection of the sons of the prophets, that in these verses he is seen to be protecting them from harm. Because uh, in their zeal uh, to gather uh, all manner of uh, herbs uh, and uh, wild gourds uh, to put into this stew, uh, something is placed in the stew that is poisonous and that makes people deathly ill and perhaps can even take someone's life. And so they cry out to Elisha saying, uh, there is death in the pot. And so he says, put some flour in it and flour is put in it and uh, it is poured out for them to eat and they eat it without harm. Now, some very famous sermons have been preached on uh, this particular uh, text uh, an Englishman by the name of K. Owen White who immigrated to uh, America and was the pastor of the Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., where Mark Dever is presently pastor, then became uh, the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Little Rock, Arkansas, in my home state, and then went on from there uh, to uh, a position of high leadership amongst Baptists in America. His most famous sermon, he preached it all over the country and it was placed in print uh, far and wide. Uh, it was simply called Death in the Pot. And his sermon, Death in the Pot, uh, said that quite obviously this death in the pot was false doctrine and that when people uh, ate what was in the pot as they imbibed the false doctrine, this necessarily had a deadening effect uh, on them and on uh, the churches. And he said it, it's very plain and clear to see that this is about a false doctrine. Uh, with all respect uh, to um, uh, Owen White, uh, a great pastor and prolific uh, writer, uh, it it is not clear at all that that's what that symbolizes or represents. Uh, certainly, uh, false doctrine does have that sort of, um, you know, effect on those who imbibe it. But I think what is clear is where we have to stand our ground this evening. And what is clear is this, that the man of God was protecting the sons of the prophets who were under his care from harm. And that is no small thing. That is a great thing indeed. Think how many times our Lord Jesus Christ protected his disciples from harm and injury. Think how many times they doubtless would have lost their lives had it not been for him. 
Uh, Think even of those occasions on which they thought they were dying and believed they would die. But yet he steadfastly protected his disciples from harm at every turn. But we see in his protection of them, not only that he is protecting them from harm, that we will keep reading there with verse 42, and we see that he also protected them from hunger. Notice what it says here in verse 42. Uh, A man came from Baal uh, Shalashah, uh, bringing the man of God uh, bread of the first fruits. 20 loaves of barley and fresh grains, uh, ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat. And have some left. And so he sent it and set it before them. And they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. Is it not clear here in this passage how he is not only protecting them from harm, but he is also protecting them from hunger. And how he is doing so in a, in a quite miraculous way way, in that he's actually setting before them a smaller amount of food than the number of men involved required. And so people began to raise objections. You can't put this amount of food in front of a hundred hungry men. There's not enough. And Elisha says once more, set it before them and they will eat and there will be some left over. Now, as my uh, grandfather, never one to mince his words, uh, would say, you have to be sort of blind in one eye and unable to see out of the other (laughs) to miss the connection between this and the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples. For on multiple occasions, we see the Lord taking a smaller amount than the number of people required and not only giving them all plenty to eat, but ensuring that there was even food left over. But a greater than Elisha is here. He wasn't feeding 100 men. On one occasion he was feeding 5,000. And on another occasion he was feeding 4,000. And so though Elisha's ministry foreshadows the ministry of our Lord, it certainly does not eclipse it. Because we see here that our Lord Jesus Christ, in an even greater way, protected his servants, not only from harm, but from hunger. Now let me ask you this. Do we not have a ministry of protection? Are we not to seek to protect the servants of the Lord from harm? Are we not to seek to protect the servants of the Lord from hunger? Are we not to be concerned about their physical protection, their safety, their health, their well-being? And are we not intended to be concerned about the material provisions which are made for them, that they would be adequate and sufficient, and that they might even have a surplus beyond what is required? 
I'm saying this to you, uh, not because uh, you are Elisha, and certainly not because you are Christ. But I'm saying this because there are biblical principles being laid down here that we should look after those who are seeking to serve the Lord. And we should ensure that they are protected from harm in as much as is possible and that they are protected from hunger, that their needs are met. An amazing thing it is. Only God is able to do this ultimately. But God uses human means and employs human instrumentality. And so let's take very seriously our responsibility to protect from harm and hunger those who seek to serve the Lord. Now let's uh, move on to chapter 6. And we'll see here in chapter 6, verse 1 to 7, and then again in those first uh, 13 verses of chapter 9, uh, some principles related not to Elisha and his protection of the sons of the prophets, but Elisha and his provision for the sons of the prophets. We have not only the sovereign protector that we sang a, a bit earlier, but we also have the one of whom we can say, uh, all I have needed, thy hand has provided. So notice in uh, chapter 6, um, verse 1, Uh, to verse 7, the following. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Uh, Let us go to Jordan, and each of us get there a log, and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, Go. And then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. And so he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. And then the man of God said, Where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. Uh, The English Standard Version reads and made the iron swim, some of the older versions read. And he said, take it up. And so he reached out his hand and took it. Well, again, we see uh, the Lord uh, Jesus Christ uh, suspending uh, those laws uh, in his own ministry And we see not simply uh, axe heads swimming on the surface of the river. Uh, We see men walking on the surface of the sea. And there's a lot to be said about that, but I want to stay on track this evening. And I want to speak to you specifically here about his provision for the sons of the prophets. And in the first instance, I want to show you his provision of a house in which they might live. Notice the language of the text. Uh, So the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, See, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan and each one of us get there a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he said, Go. In both instances, we see the provision of a house in which to live. Now, lest you think this is an agenda driven point, I think I correctly understood Reuben to say that they have a house provided in which to live, and so this is not about. That. Listen, a house was provided in which the sons of the prophets dwelled with Elisha. 
Now, living where we live, all of us ought to have heard of John Sutcliffe. But I'm uh, aware of the fact that many of us will have never heard of him. John Sutcliffe has a young man sensed a call to pastoral ministry. And in those days, someone who was serious about pastoral ministry would normally find their way to Bristol. The only way that John Sutcliffe could arrive in Bristol with sufficient funds to um, support himself uh, whilst in uh, seminary uh, was to walk. And so from his home in Yorkshire, he walked the 200 miles uh, to uh, Bristol. Uh, he did so without organizing some sort of sponsorship where his friends, you know, promised to pay a certain amount per mile. Uh, if only uh, he had had that facility. He simply walked because that was the best and most economical way of getting there. He then sat for the next few years uh, under the tutelage of some of the brightest uh, uh, theological minds uh, on the island. And when he completed uh, his uh, course of study, he was very thankful uh, for all that he had learned there in Bristol but he thought that there were some shortcomings and some inadequacies to the approach that had been taken. And so he desired to do something slightly different. And so uh, he, he moved uh, to uh, a place not a million miles away from here in Buckinghamshire, a place that was known to evangelical Christians because of the fact that uh, John Newton had once lived and served there. Sutcliffe moved to Olney. And he led the Baptist church in Olney to purchase a large house just adjacent to the church building. And over the course of the next 30 years or so, as he carried out his ministry there in Olney, he had men come in their ones and twos and live there in the house while serving alongside him and training in the church. Uh, I, can, I can give you a, a list. I, I gave uh, a lecture on the subject at the Evangelical Library uh, in London, and it was... A, it was of great benefit to me in just doing the research. But um, the men who would go on to plant churches across this island, who would uh, become some of the, the greatest pastors of their generation, and the men who would actually be at the forefront of the modern missionary movement, were men who were living there in that house in Olney, and were training, uh, not in a theological institution like Sutcliffe himself had learned, uh, but there from him and putting what they learned into immediate practice in the context of their local church. Amazing thing, isn't it? How these sorts of principles, because they are biblical, keep occurring in Old and New Testament alike, as well as in church history, as well as at the present time. Uh, we're delighted in God's kindness to have uh, recently been able to initiate the purchase uh, of a house in which our pastor Steve, uh, we trust, will be living uh, very soon. The house is quite a bit larger than he presently requires, that is by design. Because we desire for it to also be a place where interns, trainees, students can also have residence and have the opportunity alongside whatever training they're doing to get practical experience in the life of the church as well as in the life of the other churches in the Dell Collective. Amazing. 
how God provides these sorts of things. Because God is a God who is on mission and he must protect those who were going on mission with him and he must provide for them even those things which they are not meant to provide for themselves. Well, uh, could I just move quickly to Isaiah? Excuse me, (laughs) that would be very quickly. Uh, Could I move quickly to 2 Kings chapter 9? have Isaiah on the brain a couple of years preaching from that. Just put it there indelibly. 2 Kings chapter 9. need to talk to you about a different kind of house. You see the, the same word here uh, in, in 2 Kings uh, chapter 6. It was dwelling and here it is actually our English word house. But it's a very different type of house. Uh, The one is a dwelling, it is an abode, and the other is a house, and that is like a a reign, a rule. It it is a a royal term. Let me explain. So Elisha, uh, the prophet, called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, uh, tie up your garments, take this flask of oil in your hand, go to Ramoth Gilead. He didn't reserve this uh, very uh, prime responsibility for himself, though this is one of the specific things that God had told Elijah that Elisha would do. And it's a wonderful truth that one of the ones that Elisha was encouraging and teaching and training and mentoring When this responsibility was entrusted to him, it is as though Elisha himself has done it. He said, I want you to take this flask of oil, go to Ramoth Gilead, and when you arrive, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi. Go in, have him rise from among his fellows, lead him into an inner chamber, and then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel, then open the door and flee, do not linger. And that is exactly what he did in verses 4 and following. But here's what you will notice, that especially beginning in verse 7, he begins to use the language here of a house. He speaks in verse 7 of the house of Ahab. Uh, He will speak again in verse 8 of the house of Ahab. He will speak again uh, in verse 9 of the house of uh, Jeroboam. He will speak again in verse 9 of the house of uh, Basha. And then he will begin to speak about the house of Jehu. And this is when the people uh, will place all of their garments under their bare feet. They'll blow the trumpet and they will proclaim Jehu is king. So what is happening here is Elisha is not only providing a house in which the sons of the prophets will dwell, he is also a divine means of providing a house under which they will serve. You see, we need to be praying in the language of the New Testament that men like Reuben and his wife Kathy and their three boys who go out to the Philippines, that they might not be hindered in any way by governmental policies, by uh, political factions, by internal strivings, that there might be nothing in the political or governmental realm that would inhibit the spread of the gospel or would in any way uh, work against what they are seeking to do there to spread uh, the light of the gospel of Christ. And so it's not only this matter of providing uh, a house in which the sons of the prophets might live temporarily, but it's about providing a house under which they might serve freely for a generation to come. And I I, I hadn't compared notes with uh, Reuben beforehand about what he was going to say and what I was going to say. But I did want to conclude this afternoon by speaking to you about a third house. It's it's a different house than either the one spoken of in chapter 6 or the one spoken of here in chapter 9. It's the one spoken of in Psalm 127.1. 
unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Now, that's not talking about the the house that they were building there on the banks of the Jordan River. That's not talking about uh, the house which we are purchasing on Turnpike Close. Uh, That's not talking about, you know, the house uh, of a particular uh, uh, royal family under which we uh, live and serve. Well, that house there is the kingdom of God the kingdom of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. A kingdom which in this world is made visible through local churches with individual Christians who have covenanted together to obey the commands of Christ. And unless the Lord builds that house... Those who build it, labor in vain. It comes to nothing. So we should pray for our friend and brother that he would have a physical house in which to live, but that that physical house would not only be a retreat from ministry, but that it would be a place of ministry and hospitality and service to others. And we should pray for the house under which he serves, that there would be no governmental policies that would in any way inhibit the work which they are seeking to do. And that this house, which they will be seeking to build, of people covenanting together to obey Christ's commands in fellowship one with another, would indeed be built by the Lord himself, as he works by his spirit in the hearts and minds of all who will thereafter believe. May God grant it for our brother and for us, for Christ's sake. Amen.